In at number 10, Thanos and the Thing. The saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, rings ever so true when it comes to the odd pairing of Thanos and the Thing. Ben Grimm has been part of the Fantastic Four for a long time and is well aware of the horrible villains that exist throughout the Marvel Universe. As a result of his space explorations with the Fantastic Four, he's come into contact with Thanos on a number of occasions. Recognizing just how dangerous the Mad Titan is, the Fantastic Four have shut down a number of evil plans Thanos had up his big gold glove. However, during the Secret Wars timeline, the narrative between the Thing and Thanos kind of changed. At the start, Ben Grimm was acting as the vast wall to protect the God Emperor Doom and was in charge of keeping out the people who sought to overthrow him. However, in comes Thanos who took a different approach to breaching the wall. Instead, he leveled with the Thing and helped him escape this boring service of just acting like a wall. Thanos reminded Ben that the world was not right and that it needed him. Whether or not these words came with ill intentions, it was still a superhero supervillain team up against Doctor Doom that you wouldn't believe would ever exist. In at number 9, Dracula and the X-Men. The X-Men and Dracula have gone head to head on a number of occasions in the past. The Lord of Vampires even attempted to force Storm into marrying him. Gross. Although after some time it turned out they hated his son. You see his son was planning a much more evil takeover than anything his father had ever attempted. Seeking to take his father's spot as the top vampire supervillain, he engineered this biological weapon. The weapon's purpose was to turn regular civilians into bloodthirsty vampires. In a surprising turn of events though, the X-Men, Dracula and even Blade joined forces in order to restore order to the world. Although he was able to turn Jubilee right before they could defeat him, Dracula did give her an amulet that would combat this new fear of sunlight. Consider it a gift of appreciation to the X-Men. Still an unlikely team up. In at number 8, Nova and Carnage. During the event known as Axis, the Uncanny Avengers were attempting to stop the Red Skull who had stolen Charles Xavier's brain. I know, gross, right? In comes Magneto who demolishes the villain, but accidentally unlocks this psionic energy within him that releases Onslaught into the universe. Now with Onslaught being the Uncanny Avengers biggest threat, the Scarlet Witch decided to reverse the alignments of the heroes and villains. Carnage just happened to be amongst them when this went down, so in a strange turn of events, Carnage actually started to befriend Nova. Although this odd team up only lasted for a moment and purely out of circumstance, they were working together. Eventually the spell was reversed though and Carnage went back to his usual crazy self. In at number 7, Galactus and Cosmic Ghost Rider. We know this list is supposed to be the top team ups you won't believe exist, but I just have to add that this team up is by far the coolest team up ever, without a doubt. First of all, you have this possible future where Thanos just completely decimates the earth, taking out all of the heroes, or so he thought. In comes Frank Castle who survives and is now fueled by revenge. He cuts a deal with Mephisto to host the Spirit of Vengeance. Although in his hunt for Thanos on Earth, he realizes that the Mad Titan had already left. Then you get the supervillain Galactus arriving to Earth also in search of Thanos after barely making it through their battle. And the two make quite the team. In at number 6, Norman Osborn and the Sentry. This is a team up again that only really occurred out of pure circumstance. When learning about the details, you actually really start to sympathize with the Sentry and his inner struggles. After the final battle of the Secret Invasion, Norman Osborn swooped in dispatching the Skrull Queen to be viewed as a national hero. Now with this prominent position in the public eye, he was made the new director of S.H.I.E.L.D. In this position, he formed what was known as the Dark Avengers. The majority of the team was comprised of villains, with the Sentry being one of the few superheroes who agreed to stay. You see, Norman had convinced Bob Reynolds that he understood his internal battles with the Void. Not only did he show the Sentry compassion, but he promised that he could help him keep control over it. At number 5 is Thor's epic team up with Rocket and Groot. This alliance makes for a really powerful combo because when they come together, they actually managed to fend off Thanos, one of the greatest threats in all of the cosmos. When Wakanda is invaded by Thanos, T'Challa is forced to turn to external aid to keep his world from being taken over by Thanos. And the unlikely pairing of Thor, Rocket, and Groot come in to fend off the Horde. You may call it luck that allows the outcome from this battle to end well for the good guys, but I'd say it's something about this union of heroes that makes their effectiveness work so well. Maybe it was something about the fact that Thor had just been beaten down till near death by Thanos before he met up with the Guardians of the Galaxy, or maybe their powers just happened to synergize perfectly with one another. Either way, we are left with what has become one of the most epic lines in all of Infinity War. Bring me Thanos. 
I'm not gonna do it justice, you just gotta look it up. At number four is Beta Ray Bill. Thor and Beta Ray Bill have come together on numerous occasions, them being very close friends and allies on and off the battlefield. And whenever they do pair up as a team, their bond really gives them that edge that makes them thrive. Now, is it their bond or is it the fact that they're both wielding as guardian hammers made from Uru? It might be both. Let's just say it's both. Team ups between these two usually involve some kind of high stakes predicament that Asgard finds itself in. For instance, one of the more recent team ups they've had was the second coming of Ragnarok and the defeat of the Fenris Wolf. Thor eventually sends Bill away to continue his work alone, but there's no doubt that soon enough they come back together to kick some ass for the glory of Asgard. Also, I'm not sure if you're aware, but there are theories suggesting that Beta Ray Bill might make an appearance in the new Thor Love and Thunder movie coming out in July. If you know about that one frame going around online with what looks like a missing character, then you may know what I mean. But that's still speculation, so we'll see. All right, at number three is Galactus. This is a really unexpected team up that happens in Thor number 168 and 169 when Galactus actually finds himself in danger at the hands of the Black Winter. So in response to this, Galactus decides to grant Thor a boost of power to become his herald. With this newfound ally, Galactus is able to use Thor's help to take down the Black Winter as harrowing of a task as it is. This is such a crazy team up, which is why I put it higher on the list. A being as great as Galactus does doesn't often find himself in danger, nor does he find himself needing an ally to fight off a formidable threat. But in this instance, it happens, and it becomes one of the most unique and powerful Thor team-ups we've ever seen. Thor doesn't really stay loyal to Galactus though, which is a good move, because we all know that Galactus wasn't about to turn good after the job was finished. So Thor ends up stealing the entire Power Cosmic, supercharging himself into one of the most powerful versions of him that we've ever seen. He then uses this power to take down both Galactus and the Black Winter, one of his most impressive feats to date. At number two is Jane Foster. I mean, do I have to explain why this one gets put at number two? This team up gains a huge boost in points due to the iconic and romantic factor. These two have had an on again, off again relationship that has brought Jane into positions of power on Asgard and then back into average life on Earth. But in one epic return to form in Avengers number 56, Jane begins to recognize that her humble marriage to Thor might not be as it seems. And when she's proven right, Mephisto is revealed to have been behind an elaborate ruse the whole time. This triggers a Thor from somewhere in the multiverse to come and support Jane Foster in her battle against Mephisto, who appears in the form of three pigs. And yes, I know that Jane is known as Valkyrie during this fight, and basically ever since her first run as Thor, but these mantles get thrown around so much that I wanted to explore the only constant, which in this case is Jane Foster. And this isn't the last time these two have or will team up. Whoever's seen the new Thor Love and Thunder trailer knows that she is also going to be making quite the appearance in the new movie coming out in July. Romantic team ups should always rank high on these lists. Power levels aren't the only thing to consider when two heroes come together. At number one is of course Thor's epic and somewhat rare team up with his brother Loki. Actually, maybe this does happen a few times, but it's mainly because of Thor's tolerance and love for his brother more than anything. Loki still typically makes decisions only if they serve him, but I digress. One of these team ups happens in one of the earlier comics when Loki decides he'd prefer to have his father Odin rule over Asgard instead of Searcher, so he teams up with Thor to repel the demon's advances. And another time is of course in Thor The Dark World when Loki and Thor come together once more with the common motive to take revenge on their mother's killer. And then once again, so yeah, it happens a lot. Once again, they face off against Hela in Ragnarok. But the most notable team up, if we can call it that, is when Loki sacrifices himself to protect Thor from the Mad Titan. As we all know, these team ups all get so much more respect based on the typical relationship between these two siblings, which is rocky to say the least. So when they do come together, it's often very dramatic and even a bit emotional. And that's what epic team ups are all about, right? The context behind why and how a pair of superpowered beings decide to support each other in battle. Number 10, Batman and Scooby-Doo. Batman and the gang of meddling kids from Mystery Incorporated actually have quite a long history together, teaming up during the days when Batman cartoons and Scooby-Doo cartoons were both being made by Hanna-Barbera for the odd animated special. Years later, this pairing would make its way into the pages of the comics with the Dark Knight going on 
several adventures with the gang. It makes a certain kind of sense. I mean, Batman and the gang are all detectives, so they have a lot of intersecting interests. The comic book series also does a good job of going with a more silver agey take on Batman, so there isn't as much of a clash in tone when Batman pulls Scooby Snacks out of his utility belt. But there is still something kind of strange about the idea that Batman would get so stumped on a case that he would call in not another detective hero like, say, Barry Allen, but would go straight to a bunch of teenage jazz cabbage enthusiasts who live in a van with their dog. Number 9. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and the Ghostbusters When Donatello of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles created an interspatial teleportation unit, he asked his brothers Michelangelo, Leonardo, and Raphael to help him test the device's capabilities. They go through the portal with their friends April O'Neil and Casey Jones and discover that the device has transported them to a different New York, the one featured in the Ghostbusters universe. They are immediately put face to face with an evil ghost who of course is immune to their attacks and captures and possesses Casey. Thankfully, they are soon saved by everyone's favorite group of paranormal exterminators, Venkman, Winston, Egon, and Ray, the Ghostbusters. The two groups team up and the combination works better than you might expect. There's a certain joy to seeing Venkman start to get on Raph's nerves, while Winston and Leonardo bond over how difficult it is to be the most normal one on a team. Plus, seeing Leonardo swap his bow staff for a proton pack is something I never knew I always wanted to see. Number 8. Superman and Muhammad Ali This one is perhaps the most iconic of the weird team-ups ever put to panel. One day, Muhammad Ali is in Metropolis playing basketball with some local kids, and Lois, Jimmy, and Clark set out to get an interview with him. Just as they are about to begin their interview, an alien shows up and requests the greatest champion of Earth to fight in an alien boxing match. He has an armada of ships and is going to blow up Earth if they don't accept the challenge. Clark excuses himself, and Superman shows up, offering to fight. Ali retorts that he will fight the aliens as he is the greatest fighter on Earth. Superman points out that that is a stupid plan because he's, you know, Superman. But Ali reminds him that he's, you know, Muhammad Ali. The alien tells them that they will fight and the winner will face the alien champion. Ali and Superman go to the Fortress of Solitude to train, and Ali teaches Supes some of his moves before they are interrupted by the aliens who inform them that the fight will take place on their homeworld, which has a red sun, meaning Superman won't have any powers. Ali points out that Superman is in serious trouble. The two have a boxing match, and Ali KOs Superman after a few rounds and goes on to fight the alien champion. It turns out that Superman and Ali fixed the fight, and while Ali fights, Superman is taking out the alien fleet. Ali wins the match and the Earth is saved. Later on Earth, Ali reveals that he has figured out Superman's secret identity, and the two shake hands as Ali declares, Superman, we are the greatest. It's a weird story and kinda goofy, but it has become such a classic, and the dynamic between Superman and Muhammad Ali is actually so well done that it is worth reading. Number 7. The Avengers Meet David Letterman In Avengers number 239, Wonder Man is having a bit of a problem. He has been trying to make it as an actor, but it hasn't been working out. His agent is aware of his status as a reserve Avenger and books Wonder Man on David Letterman, claiming that he will be accompanied by some of the other Avengers. Wonder Man reaches out to Vision, who arranges for himself, Black Panther, Hawkeye, Beast, and Black Widow to join Wonder Man on the late night talk show appearance. The villain, Fabian Stanowitz, otherwise known as the Meccano Marauder, sees the promo and decides that he will also be attending. The Avengers go on the show, and Dave interviews the group, getting the bombshell that Beast is leaving the Avengers to start the Defenders, but the interview is interrupted by an attack from Fabian's machines, while Paul Schaefer keeps the band playing to keep the crowd from panicking. Fabian sits down for an interview with Letterman, surrounding them with a force field so they won't be interrupted by the Avengers or the machines. Dave then uses his classic giant doorknob prop to knock out the villain, saving the day. Wonder Man is thrilled that his heroic exploits will be shown on television, but when the show is set to air, it is interrupted by a special news bulletin and no one gets to see it. Number 6. The X-Men Meet the Crew of the Enterprise Captain's Log Stardate 
4740.5. The crew of the Enterprise came across an odd alien ship. They scanned it for life and saw that it was carrying seven life forms that sensors indicated were near human. Before more information could be gathered, the ship exploded, and a giant creature calling himself the Gladiator appeared and punched the Enterprise. As the engineer, Mr. Scott, attempted to repair the damage to the shields, a group of stowaways who had beamed off the destroyed ship at the last moment came aboard. They called themselves the X-Men. So the X-Men had set off to save the galaxy, and were now hiding on the Enterprise, very confused as to how they had ended up in the future. Gambit was injured, and Beast took him to the ship's sick bay to find treatment. It was here that Dr. McCoy met Dr. McCoy. The remaining X-Men were discovered by Mr. Spock, who incapacitated Wolverine with the Vulcan nerve pinch and took the team to meet Captain Kirk so they could work together to defeat the villains. This is a fun story filled with some cool moments, like the aforementioned Spock and Wolverine fight, as well as some fun character moments, like Kirk trying to hit on Jean Grey. But the X-Men and Enterprise crew are an odd pair to pitch together, and the entire affair does feel pretty weird. Number 5. Jessica Jones. I think Batman would feel a lot of respect for Jessica Jones. The two could team up on a case together, maybe they were both tracking the same perp for different reasons, they run into each other, or maybe Bruce decides he wants a fresh start and decides to live under an alias as a private PI of his own, and the two end up as like rival detectives competing for cases. But these two are bound to do well together whatever happens, and it never hurts to have Batman team up with someone who has real superpowers, in case they run into a threat too large for Batman's planning, or vice versa, a problem that just can't be crushed by Jessica's super strength, and maybe it needs Batman's help in terms of locating that perfect weak spot. They'd complement each other so well. Number 4. Daredevil Two costumes that are designed to scare, with one that might possibly be more terrifying than the other. I'll let you battle out in the comments as to who you think I'm talking about there. Who is the scarier costume? Hmm. What do you think? Both are masterful investigators who pose as wealthy citizens during the day, and are sometimes known for their playboy tendencies. These two are both brutal assailants with a belief in justice and a policy for not killing their enemies, just beating them senseless. Two that we would love to see on a murder case. In fact, we already have. These two have teamed up once in 1997 in Daredevil slash Batman Eye for an Eye, and again in 2000 in the sequel King of New York. You know, a team up is good when it happens again that soon after. And seeing as how it's been almost 20 years, I figured we're due for another team up of these two different yet similar heroes. P.S. Their team ups are pretty good, so. Just saying, maybe we get some more now? DC and Marvel, do more crossover things, please. We want it. Number 3. Captain America Considering that Batman is best friends with Superman, is anyone surprised that many would love to see Batman and Captain America team up? In fact, it shouldn't be surprising because these two did team up in 1996, accompanied by their own sidekicks. This comic was kind of actually more of a sidekick swap than anything, though, where Batman ended up with Bucky and Cap ended up working with Robin to take down the Red Skull and Joker. Or in the end, really just Red Skull, as the Joker himself defected from the plot after finding out that he was working for a non Nazi. Apparently even for Joker that's too much. I will kill a bunch of babies, but Nazis that's where I draw the line. The two also crossed paths in an Avengers and Justice League crossover where Batman actually decided to call a truce while fighting Cap, realizing that in Steve Rogers he had found a fairly even match to his abilities, and that the fight was kinda pointless. They were just both gonna probably fight each other forever if they didn't stop it, so. I'd love to see the two of these strong, evenly matched superheroes come together to protect not just the Earth, but the universe. I'd like to see Darkseid and Thanos end up somehow working together and then Cap and Batman have to like lead a team and take them on. Be pretty crazy. I know it was pretty crazy in like JLA slash Avengers, but I think we could go even crazier with it. Cap and Bats make too good of a team, and it's been too long since we've seen this pair together, so Come on, give me something new. Give me something even bigger than that crossover. Or like just Batman and, and Cat versus the universe. Number two, Nick Fury. Both are known for always being super prepared, and both are super sleuths who pride themselves on knowing what's going on at all times, even when we think there is no way that they could have known. Remember that whole ordeal with Jezebel Jet and Batman? She revealed it was all a ruse, and then he revealed he knew it was a ruse, and he was also performing a ruse on her. And we were like, wait, what? If you knew, then why did you sleep with her? What's happening? Anyways, Nick Fury and Batman would also likely complement one another in terms of their way that they approach going about doing their business. And getting the job done. Both are focused and serious. It could be cool to see Batman be recruited by S.H.I.E.L.D. in order to help with a special ops mission, and then go in with Nick Fury. Or maybe the two would both be leaders of like their own team out on the same mission, and just run into each other, see the value of each other, and then team up. That could be cool. 
Secret Agent Batman. Batman James Bond mashup. That would also be cool. Number one, Deadpool. In the Spider Man slash Deadpool team up comic issue number six, we see Deadpool and Spidey talking about superhero movies. The two end up attending a spoof version of Batman v Superman when they watch Nighthawk v Hyperion. They take turns after the viewing pointing out everything wrong with the film the lack of motivation and the obsession with like thinking five films ahead instead of simply working at all towards making the film itself a standalone success. I would love a team up that cast Batman and Deadpool in like a similar vibe and just turns this joke back on Deadpool himself. DC might not be down as it also kind of makes fun of the Batman v Supes film itself, but the punchline would actually be that Deadpool is the king of nonsensical fights in the comic book world. He frequently ends up tussling with Wolverine for no other reason than he can. He fights a lot of people in comics sometimes for just no reason. So, But whatever story DC and Marvel choose to explore with these two heroes, just the two characters sharing a page would likely be a treat. Just just a panel even. Give me a panel. Batman could play the perfect straight man to Wade's crazy. And I'm sure both would drive one another up the wall. And keep in mind, Deadpool isn't easy to frustrate in a team up. He's usually got too much pep in his step. But if anyone can annoy Wade, I'll bet it's Batman. He'd be way too serious. Thank you for watching Nerd Squad. Who do you think has a more frightening getup? Daredevil or Batman? Who from the Marvel world would you like to see Batman team up with? Do you think there are any Marvel villains that he could be persuaded into working with? Hmm. Let us know in the comments below. And speaking of comments, it's time to turn to some comments from one of our latest videos, Top 10 Superheroes Who Became Gods, Part 2. Jose Ortega commented, Amanda looks like she can gain god level superpowers, be it where her might. It's true. If I get my hands on that Phoenix Force, y'all better watch out. It would probably corrupt me. So much power. In what way would you like to get god powers actually if you could? Let me know in the comments. Robert Spears says, I would like to see Miles Morales or Gwen Stacy as Captain Universe or maybe bring back Ben Riley and make him Captain Universe. That sounds like it would be doable. I mean, if Aunt May can get cosmic powers and become golden oldie, I'm sure these other alternates could find a way to get that sweet, sweet enigma force. I'd really love to see Miles actually become Captain Universe. Number 10, Mockingbird. In this story from 1980, Spider-Man heads off to Los Angeles and has a run-in with Mockingbird, as well as Nick Fury. This issue fleshes out a lot of the world of S.H.I.E.L.D. and features some stuff that comes up in the movie Captain America The Winter Soldier. This is far from the weirdest choice on the list, but still has a lot of really weird moments, like Spider-Man pulling a guy from a flying car and tossing him to the street 20 feet below. It's a pretty fun issue, with a lot of great moments with the aforementioned flying car and Mockingbird kicking some real butt with her battle staves. It's S.H.I.E.L.D. versus Mockingbird, with Spider-Man sort of caught in the middle. He doesn't even like being in LA. Thankfully, things work out for Mockingbird in the end and she survives getting totally blasted by S.H.I.E.L.D. She actually has quite a career with Marvel, getting her own comic series in 2016 and was even voted number 48 out of 50 in IGN's Top 50 Avengers. She like barely made the list. Just like this list. Number 9, Ghost Rider. Now these two definitely make for an unusual pairing. I feel like Ghost Rider with his pen and stare is pretty much the furthest possible thing from the tongue lashing Spidey dishes out with the endless quips and puns. In this story called If an Eye Offend Thee, our dynamic duo goes up against Orb, a mysterious villain with a giant eyeball for a head. Peter Parker and MJ see a billboard advertising Ghost Rider's latest stunt show and decide to come and watch, blow off some steam, you know? Pete is really impressed by Ghost Rider's makeup, not suspecting he's actually possessed by a demon. During the show, Orb shows up and entrances the guards and the crowd just by looking at them with his giant eyeball, then attempts to kidnap Ghost Rider's girlfriend, Roxanne. Ghost Rider is unable to catch Orb as he uses his hypnosis to make audience members walk in front of the Ghost Rider, causing him to wipe out on his cycle. In the stunning conclusion, they leap out of the way of a train, Ghost Rider and Spider-Man, but Orb is not so lucky and totally gets hit. However, when they search the scene afterwards, they fail to locate Orb's body. Finally, Spider-Man swings off into the night, a bit disturbed by Ghost Rider's comment that he's not wearing a mask or makeup. Number 8. The Werewolf by Night In this issue, Spidey is on the move again, this time to San Francisco on an assignment for the Daily Bugle. Exploring the Golden Gate Bridge, he barely reacts in time when the werewolf leaps out from a hiding place and attacks. Spidey stops the both of them from falling to their deaths with a quick bit of webbing action and then tosses Werewolf off of the bridge into the water. The end. 
I'm just kidding. Werewolf does appear again later, but during the encounter, the sun rises and Peter witnesses him changing back into his human form, Jack Russell. Spidey decides to help Jack and before long, he's confronting Moondark in a theater, taking him down and helping the werewolf to return to normal, no longer under Moondark's influence. Spidey does a lot of monologuing in this issue, recounting the recent death of Gwen Stacy and other recent events in his run. Also neat fact, Spidey's adventures in San Francisco continue along in the next Daredevil, issue 103, where those two meet up and team up against Ramrod. Black Widow is actually in that episode too. Team ups! Number 7, Red Sonja. Spider-Man and Red Sonja actually had an exciting romantically charged adventure recently across five issues in 2007, but I'm talking about their first encounter in Marvel Team Up number 79 from 1979 called Sword of the She-Devil. Red Sonja first appeared as a character in Conan the Barbarian, but she went on to have her very own popular series and even a movie in the 80s. In this epic issue, we see worlds collide as Mary Jane transforms into Red Sonja. Red Sonja fights along Spider-Man against an evil sorcerer. The writers cleverly use a museum and some ancient artifacts to connect Sonya's world to the modern day New York home of Spider-Man. It's pretty epic seeing the combination of fantasy monsters and swords mixed with the classic Spider-Man quipping and web slinging. I'm sure fans who liked both comics at the time really enjoyed this crossover. In the end, Red Sonya transforms back into MJ on page 19, revealing that she was only possessed. It's one of the few examples where possession isn't necessarily a bad thing. Spidey would have had a hard time taking on this foe by himself. Number six, Frankenstein's monster. This issue was definitely an attempt to boost sales and create more support for Marvel's Frankenstein character, whose run started in 1973. During this story, Frankenstein recaps his origin from Frankenstein issue number one, and he talks a bit about his battles against Dracula in issues seven through 11. So basically in the issue, Spider-Man gets blasted with a ray beam while he's trying to stop a robbery and inexplicably wakes up on a table next to Frankenstein. They escape from this castle and find themselves in the mountains and later rescue Judith Klemmer, an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. on an assignment to stop the monster maker Von Schucht, who plans to rule the world with an army of monsters classic. Spidey and Judith sneak in the back of his castle while Frankenstein just busts in the front door beating the crap out of anybody who opposes him. When Frankenstein finally walks into the main chamber, he sees the monster maker releasing another prisoner against Spidey and Judith, the man wolf. The story is continued in issue number 37, but I'll leave that for you to discover on your own. Number 5. Dr. Psycho and Riddler and Parademons Dr. Psycho ends up allying himself with the Riddler in the Harley Quinn animated series. Originally it's Harley who wants to team up with Darkseid with her gang, but in the end she ends up surrendering her army of parademons that Darkseid supplied her with after realizing she's really doing all of this, you know, conquering Earth to try and escape her romantic feelings for Poison Ivy, who is about to get married to Kite Man at this point in the series. Yikes, awkward. Dr. Psycho ends up becoming the big bad of the latest season in the end, with Riddler becoming his partner in crime and wielding great control over the leftover Parademon army on Earth, which he has no qualms about using, unlike Harley, who's like, yeah, maybe I'm, I'm going a little too far. But yeah, Psycho's into it. A little too into it. Very much too into it. Number four, Juggernaut and Black Tom Cassidy. These two aren't just great villains when it comes to their working relationship they were also like fast friends and kind of best friends. I love it. Black Tom and Juggernaut have been good friends and allies since Black Tom's first full appearance in the comics in Uncanny X-Men issue 101. And I know what you guys are thinking. You're thinking, oh, but Amanda, that wasn't Black Tom's first appearance, but it was his first full appearance. So I believe his first cameo appearance was like issue 99, but don't quote me on that. Only a few issues later, they were already proving themselves to be a deadly duo as they teamed up to successfully kidnap and torment the X-Men in the hopes that this would inspire Professor Xavier to offer his own life up in exchange for his students' freedom. Unfortunately, <laughs> they ended up getting tricked by Nightcrawler and ultimately were defeated. But still, this was a pretty good attempt to defeat the X-Men and Charles Xavier. Juggy's never gonna get over that. Or well, actually, yeah, he'll probably never get over it. I, I stand by what I said. Gotta be hard for Juggernaut right now. Like all of the mutants are off in Krakoa and he's not a mutant. It's challenging. Number three, Lex Luthor and Brainiac. They were almost a complete success even in their very first team up. 
almost. Together, Lex Luthor and Brainiac appeared in issue 167 of Superman, where they teamed up in a three-part story to take down their joint foe. Their brilliance and technological know-how combined allowed them to both shrink and depower Superman, but unfortunately for them, Superman would not stand by and let himself be so easily defeated. Or so, like, well defeated, because I think that's a pretty good plan. And he found a way to escape their wrath. They honestly should have just squashed him when they had a chance, but hey, then we wouldn't have any more stories. Flex and Brainiac together, in fact, are such a fan favorite. We've even seen them in the most intense kind of team up in the DC animated universe when they merged both their minds and bodies together into one being. Like, you know your partnership is like intense when you're just like, let's just join and be one, one being, but also terrifying. I don't want to fight Lex and Brainiac merged together. Number two, Masters of Evil. Another very iconic and successful group of supervillains who have teamed up together. This roster has also changed dramatically over the years when it comes to their members, and despite the fact that they have some members who are less popular when it comes to their notoriety, this seems to be a team that generally has some measure of success when it comes to their evil plots. The team has consisted of such members as Moonstone, Radioactive Man, Tiger Shark, Titania, and Absorbing Man, with any of the Zemos usually being seen as the most successful leaders of the team to date. But they've also had a lot of different leaders. To date, we've seen multiple incarnations of the team, and we're actually likely in or at least approaching the double digits, I think, at this point, when it comes to all the different rosters that we've seen. Number one, Poison Ivy and Harley Quinn. Yeah, so if you know me, you may have already guessed that they'd be at my top, but yeah, I love Poison Ivy and Harley Quinn. Never mind being, I think, some of the, the best supervillain team-ups out there. It's just two amazing characters. You give me two amazing villains together, I'm gonna say that it worked well. These two work together in a way that almost allows them to move from the side of villain to hero. In fact, over the last few years that we've seen their characters develop together, they have both become more and more heroic. Though Ivy is now, of course, kind of headed back in the direction of straight-up villain, currently in the comics, after her and Harley's relationship kind of fell apart in the aftermath of Heroes in Crisis. Still, for the most part, these two have brought out a lot of the best in each other, and have also managed to pull off some pretty impressive schemes along the way. I don't know whether making each other better and bringing out the hero in each other means that these two should be considered a great or an awful supervillain team-up, but I personally like to see that as a win, even if it doesn't align with the villainous focus of this list. Any partnership where you bring out the best in someone, for good or for evil, should be considered one of the greatest in my books, because you know, that's what partnerships and or relationships are all about. At number 10, we have Valkyrie. This is one of the more understandable team-ups on the list, considering both Thor and Valkyrie are known to be loyal to the same cause. Speaking, of course, about the prosperity of Asgard and the protection of the Nine Realms. In one particular instance, during the Ragnarok event, Valkyrie and Thor team up in an effort to save Asgard from total destruction at the hands of Hela, and they even take on Thanos at one point. Although they are ultimately unsuccessful and Asgard is destroyed, this is no doubt an epic union between these two heroes. And we can expect them to come together again down the line, knowing that they have a deep respect for each other and very similar stakes on the table. At number 9, we have Hercules. Thor and Herc come together a few different times, both as allies and as enemies, but of course we'll be focusing on their team-ups for this list. At one point, Hercules finds himself under the control of the Greek god Pluto, having been tricked into ruling the netherworld after signing a film contract. Undoubtedly a bizarre situation to find himself in, but nonetheless, he gets help from Thor, who had previously been more of an adversary to Herc. In fact, before the actual team up that this entry is about, Hercules and Thor fight a few more times accidentally, which is really weird because it starts to paint Hercules as this very confused and possibly, I don't know, insecure character who doesn't seem to know what he really wants. Finally, they do end up teaming together and they team up to take down the Wrecking Crew. Later, Herc becomes an ally to the Avengers, which makes for a few more team-ups with the God of Thunder, most notably during the Operation Galactic Storm storyline. At number eight, we have Thor's team up with Iron Man. Although this pair tend to be known to butt heads from time to time, there have been a number of cases of them fighting alongside one another. Of course they have, they're both part of the same very famous superhero team, the Avengers. But I'm not referring to their time on the Avengers, I'm looking at the times when the two heroes go off on their own. One of these times is during the God Complex storyline as part of their 2010 miniseries of comics called 
Iron Man slash Thor, fittingly. And the threat they're up against isn't a joke either. They're trying to stop the high evolutionary from creating a modern god from nothing using Iron Man as the vessel. So it's good that Tony Stark has Thor on his side for this one because dealing with gods and mysticism isn't always the easiest to do on your own if you're immortal, no matter how much money and tech you have. At number seven is none other than Captain America. Aside from the obvious reason to team up, Thor and Captain America have a pretty healthy relationship going just the two of them. Possibly the most notable instance of the two teaming up is during the Avengers Prime miniseries when they go to hell and fight Hela, Thor's sister. Although Iron Man is there as well, Thor and Tony Stark aren't really getting along during this issue and it more so outlines the relationship between Thor and Cap both on and off the battlefield. And this is a pretty notable team up as well, given the stakes and the villain they're facing. Hela is one of the most powerful threats out there and hell is her domain, naturally. So having Captain America there is really important because if Thor was just accompanied by Iron Man, given their frustrations, it may not have been a successful mission for either of them. They do end up succeeding and yes, Thor and Iron Man do come back together as friends but it takes a pretty harrowing battle in the underworld to make that happen. And Captain America's leadership is essential to their success. At number six, we have the Hulk. In Thor Ragnarok, Thor and the Hulk come together as a team in an unusual occurrence when they face off against Loki. And they make a surprisingly fitting duo, both having been banished from their home worlds and forced to face off in this strange gladiatorial arena. At this point in the story, Thor is banished from Asgard and without his hammer, and Hulk finds himself lost on a distant planet, banished from Earth. At this point, he's being used as nothing more than a subject for this planet's violent arena matches, and he even gets pitted against Thor before they eventually decide to team up. So when they do decide to defy their captors and fly back to where they came from, there's more than their combined strength that drives them forward. A bond based on their own experiences with abandonment and desperation leads them to an epic win over Loki by the end of the movie. At number five is a weird one for sure. The Avengers actually team up with the Guardians of the Galaxy to face off against Titans from the Attack on Titan universe. This issue is called Attack on Avengers, naturally, and and it's a super short eight pages long. Basically, the plot is that the Titans just show up in New York City and start causing problems. Problems like eating people, you know? What I find strange about this, aside from the obvious, is that the Avengers and the Guardians of the Galaxy pair up in the first place. I feel like it's already a complicated enough concept to have the Avengers versus Attack on Titan, but then they just go and complicate it even further, which is just strange. It doesn't get in the way of it, it's just weird. It's known to be a pretty fun read though. It doesn't go deep into any complex plot or anything. It just sort of has the heroes show off their abilities one after the other to take down the Titans. It's unclear who wins the battle though with the issue just kind of ending with the Guardians of the Galaxy tapping in to do some Titan killing of their own. At number four, we have a personal favorite of mine, the Punisher teaming up with Eminem. When I found out this team up took place, I was so happy. It's just such a good fit given their darker personalities and makes me like Eminem more that he'd even go for something like this. This comic came out back in 2009 the same year that Eminem released his Relapse album, just for context for all you Eminem fans out there. The plot is pretty simple with Barracuda being the villain in the comic that the two team up to take down. The strange part of this issue, other than the part where Eminem and the Punisher are teaming up, is a decision which I think was a bit of a misstep, and it's that Eminem is totally OP. He beats up the Punisher before they even team up for one, which I guess gives Eminem a pretty impressive power stat canonically, and then when they're kidnapped by Barracuda and taken to the Arctic to be killed, Eminem breaks free and saves the Punisher, killing Barracuda with a chainsaw in the process, which sort of weakens the integrity of the Punisher just to boost Eminem. I feel like they could have easily played with Eminem's funny personality a little more and had the two characters play off each other to give us a more humble and dynamic story. But maybe Eminem just said yes to this gig so he could look cool and somehow even more badass than the Punisher. At number three, we have Superman teaming up with Bugs Bunny. You heard me correctly. This team up could also just as easily be considered a DC Comics and Looney Tunes crossover, but out of all the different characters from both franchises, Bugs and Superman are two of the more significant characters who end up associating with one another, which is just a bonkers duo to have teamed up in the first place. The way that these worlds collide is that Mixie Yes Pitlick and Yo-Yo the Dodo basically just manipulate reality to make the pair up happen for fun, which I guess is the only real way to justify 
try something as weird as this. They don't really do much as a pair, but you can imagine that Bugs just kind of wanders around and quips while Superman tries to figure out how to get him to focus. There's more to it than that, I'm sure, but honestly, you'd have to pay me to actually read all the way through this thing. No offense if this is a favorite of yours, I just, I don't know. I saw the cover and I, I couldn't do it. At number two is kind of a part two to number three, if that sentence made any sense. It's Batman and Elmer Fudd. This is just the most bizarre team up again with the very loose through line that they're both sort of detectives. Elmer is a hunter, but he's usually like creeping around looking for Bugs Bunny clues and stuff. Either way, this issue is actually known to be strangely good and suspenseful, considering what it is. It has Elmer Fudd partaking in a dark noir storyline on the hunt for a mysterious killer known as The Bunny. But things keep getting more complicated for Fudd when Batman turns out to be the real culprit. Believe it or not, this is a different storyline from the previous entry, which just makes me wonder how the hell Looney Tunes and DC Comics kept thinking it would be a smart idea to give their characters crossovers. Although, it seemingly worked for people. People seem to like this one with Elmer Fudd, so maybe they were onto something? At number one is a very, very strange one. Batman and the Beatles, or the copyright free version of the Beatles anyway. This one doesn't seem to have any common thread to tie these two pop culture worlds together. I really tried to think of one, but I just couldn't. Maybe the writer is just a big Beatles fan and wanted an excuse to get in touch with Paul McCartney's people if he needed to. Maybe they were safe from copyright because they don't really look like them. I mean, to be fair, the plot of the comic is about as clever as it could have been given the pairing. Batman is basically trying to investigate whether or not Paul of the Beatles is actually dead. For those of you who don't don't know, there was a fan generated rumor years ago floating around about the idea that Paul had actually died and was secretly replaced by a guy named William Campbell. So this ridiculous theory is what Batman is trying to get to the bottom of. And what ends up happening, spoiler alert, is that Batman actually discovers it was the other members of the band who were the fake and that Paul was the only original member of the band remaining, which is it's riveting stuff and super bizarre, perfectly bizarre. Number 10, Doctor Strange. Why is this mashup so appealing? The same reason I enjoy watching Batman and Zatanna together. The idea of Batman needing assistance with something of a more supernatural nature and the idea of a mortal human detective based in cold hard reality mashing up in a scenario that requires his skill but is just enough mysticism sprinkled in to warrant Doctor Strange's involvement. I would love it if these two went on some kind of spiritual ghost hunt together, a la the early Doctor Strange days. Or maybe the two could meet at some kind of meditation retreat and both get called into action and have to team up. Another idea for the two would be to have Doctor Strange of Earth 616 team up with the vampiric Batman of Earth 43. Vampiric? Vampiric? I guess it doesn't really matter which way you say that word. Potato, potato. It wouldn't be the first time Doctor Strange has worked with or against the undead who call themselves Vampire. During the Montessi Formula story arc, he teamed teamed up with vampire detective Hannibal King and Blade, working to defeat Dracula himself. Another idea is the arcane arts come to Gotham in the form of a villain who is experimenting with magics. Maybe Black Mask, which could be spooky, or maybe Calendar Man is no longer posing as a stage magician as he did during his debut in Detective Comics issue 259, but has become a real one. That could be a fun kind of adventure. And Doctor Strange answers the call to help as Zatanna is unavailable. You know, sometimes she's busy, she can't help Batman all the time. She got things. Number 9, Iron Man. Both are billionaire playboys, or at least appear to be. Still, while Batman might not agree with Tony's lifestyle choices, both characters are known for their brilliance and for their obsession with control and ability to plan ahead. And this might be enough to make them a strong team up. Tony, after all, was the instigator behind Civil War 1 with his Superhero Registration Act. He has since learned the error of his ways, but still tends to be quite lawful when it comes to his views. He would be lawful good for sure if he were a D&D character. Meanwhile, Batman suffers from boredom borderline OCD and paranoia when it comes to being prepared, and as such created contingency plans for all of his fellow JLA members, only to have them fall into the hands of Ra's al Ghul and be used against his teammates, forcing him to apologize to the team. Neither is a known killer, and both heroes prefer to trust in the system when it comes to vengeance and justice. Plus, we all know we would want to see Batman get his own Iron Man suit, complete with a little metal bat ears. That'd be great. <laughs> I'm Iron Man now. Woo! Iron Bat. Oh. 
Iron Bat would be awesome. Make it happen. Number eight, Spider Man. I mean, you knew he was going to be on here because who wouldn't want to see just about anyone team up with Spider Man, right? The crazy thing is, this dream team has already happened. The pair had a one shot team up in 1995 with the comic Spider Man and Batman Disordered Minds. But it's been over 20 years since the two have shared the pages of a comic book, and I think it's about time we make this happen again. Besides, we have to have Black Cat and Catwoman join in for this team up. As cool as Carnage and the Joker were together, I'm personally more interested in seeing a caper story where Catwoman and Black Cat team up for some good old fashioned thieving and Spider Man and Batman have to put a stop to their dangerous femme fatales. Oh my gosh, I was almost like, lady swap anyone? <laughs> and I was like, wait. Number seven, Black Panther. These two together would truly be some of the most teched out. I know what you're thinking, but what about the Bats and Iron Man team up I suggested earlier? Yes, those two would also have a ton of tech, but Black Panther comes from Wakanda, and as great as Tony's tech might be, not even Stark can beat the tech coming out of Panther's homeland. Black Panther and Bats also have a similar look and sometimes a similar fighting style, though I would say that Batman is kind of the sneakier of the two. Let's have them team up. Number six, Iron Fist. These two are both skilled martial artists who I would love to both see duke it out and then combine their skills to take down a big bat. I think Iron Fist could even give Batman more of a run for his money than any other hero from Marvel who he's taken in hand to hand combat. I'm imagining Bruce joining with Danny in an attempt to take down the League of Assassins or The Hand. Seeing them have to take on someone like Lady Shiva or maybe someone like Taskmaster could also be super interesting. Who do you think that that pair should take on? Give me your best martial artists, villains. Number five, the Punisher meets. Slim Shady. Getting into the really weird team ups, we have the time that Frank Castle met Marshall Mathers. In this story, Eminem is leaving a concert with his security when they come across a strange man in a skull shirt in the alley. They pull their guns on him and get absolutely blown away while M makes a break for it. He's rescued by his childhood friend, the Barracuda, who helps him hide from Castle. When Punisher gets too close, Slim Shady beats him up and shoots him. Barracuda then takes out Eminem and and when he wakes up, he's on a boat tied back to back with the Punisher. Punisher explains that he was trying to protect Eminem and only took out his bodyguards because they pulled guns on him and probably all had rap sheets anyways. Barracuda explains that the parents music council has hired him to kill Shady because they think his music is corrupting the youth. He throws M off the side of the boat, but the water is frozen and he manages to get away. He finds an ice fisherman, takes his chainsaw and returns to the boat to save the Punisher. After freeing Frank, Punisher leaves Eminem stranded on the ice with a phone to call for help as he sets off to take out the parents' music council. After all, hiring a contract killer is a serious crime. What? This book is insane! Not just for the premise, but the fact that the Punisher doesn't do anything except get beaten up and later rescued by Eminem. But it isn't the weirdest Punisher crossover. Uh, more on that later. Number four, Spider-Man and the cast of SNL. Live from New York, it's Spider Day Night Live! Starring Dan Aykroyd, John Belushi, Jane Curtin, Garrett Morris, Bill Murray, Lorraine Newman, and Gilda Radner. In Marvel Team Up number 74, Spider-Man got to team up with the classic Saturday Night Live cast in one of the weirdest team ups in the wall crawler's history. Peter and MJ are attending a filming of Saturday Night Live, but little do they know that the show is about to be interrupted by the Silver Samurai, whose magic ring has been sent to John Belushi by accident due to his SNL Samurai character being mistaken for the Silver Samurai. Thugs try to take over the show, but the cast keeps the show going while taking out the thugs with the help of Spider-Man, while the two samurai face off backstage. It is extra weird because the celebrity host is Stan Lee, and the SNL cast are dressing up as Marvel characters. But in a world where Marvel heroes are real, what exactly is Stan Lee famous for? Number three, Jimmy Olsen and Don Rickles. In Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen number 141, written by Jack Kirk, Kirby of all people, Jimmy teams up with the Golden Guardian and Goody Rickles, the superhero who just happens to look like the insult comic and Mr. Potato Head actor Don Rickles. They are poisoned by Intergang and have to find a cure before they explode. They end up at an office where the real Don Rickles is hanging out and just starts slowly going nuts as superhero hijinks take place around him. Eventually the heroes are cured, but Rickles is taken away by the police after claiming that he is going to explode 
explode in an effort to get away from Jimmy and his gang. It is a difficult story to follow and wouldn't make this list if it weren't for the weird detail of Don Rickles having a superhero who is not related to him but is named Goody Rickles and just happens to look exactly like him. That's just all kinds of strange. Number two, The Punisher meets Archie. In a crossover that started out as a joke between the publishers of the two characters, a criminal who looks remarkably like Archie is being chased by The Punisher. He escapes to Riverdale and The Punisher pursues him there. Archie is up to his usual hijinks trying to date both Betty and Veronica when a bunch of feds mistaking him for his criminal doppelganger take him away. They are attacked by The Punisher who realizes his mistake and goes after the double who has taken Veronica to the town sock hop. Punisher goes to the dance and is mistaken for a chaperone by the teachers. Things go off the rails when the villain takes Veronica hostage and a shootout breaks out at the dance. The bad guy gets away with Ronnie and Archie has to team up with Frank to take him out. Archie starts keeping a war journal and Frank gets a nice Riverdale sweater as a gift and together they save Veronica and stop the villain who they tie to a giant balloon and let fly away, presumably so he will fly into the air and lose oxygen and die. As if all of this wasn't weird enough, the story ends with Professor X informing Wolverine that he has to go after the most dangerous mutant alive, Jughead. Number one, Green Lantern and Colonel Sanders. Colonel Sanders has shown up in DC Comics stories a few times, having traveled the multiverse and hired Captain Cold and Mirror Master to work in his restaurants. But his weirdest story is when he teamed up with Hal Jordan, the Green Lantern. In this story, the Colonel is working with Ferris Air to test that his new packaging for his Zinger chicken sandwich will protect it for interstellar travel, as he wants to bring his food across the universe. He enlists the help of Green Lantern to help him deliver the food, and Hal agrees. As Hal tells him, every member of the Green Lantern Corps is working on this project meaning somewhere a planet is being attacked by Darkseid and the lanterns are delivering chicken sandwiches. The sandwiches are all stolen by the orange lantern Lar Fleas and Hal creates a KFC themed green lantern ring for the colonel so they can go after the sandwiches. Sanders attacks Lar Fleas with a drumstick construct and Lar Fleas admits that the zinger chicken sandwich is the only thing that has ever satisfied his unending longing and hunger. Sanders uses his ring to create the first KFC on the planet Okara and lets Lar Fleas sign on as a franchisee. Assuming that the Orange Lantern can complete the training program to get his cooking to the Colonel's strict standards. This book is so weird. It's like those old Twinkie ads where Flash would defeat Weather Wizard with the delicious taste of Hostess Twinkie Cakes, but instead of being one page long, it's the entire comic. So weird. Number 10, The Wizard and Trapster. These two would go on to become important founding members of the Frightful Four villain team, but even before that, they were teaming up together. Way Way back when Trapster was known simply as Pacepot Pete, these two worked together in Strange Tales in an effort to defame and defeat the Human Torch, Johnny Storm. In the end, the Torch escaped their trap and apprehended both of them, turning them in. But still, for two C or D list villains, they came pretty close to killing the Fantastic Four hero, using Pete's pace and an airtight room that was quickly being drained of its oxygen. Also, I don't know if the Wizard's actually a C list villain. I might actually bump him up. Also, Paste Pot Pete is hard to say if you say it like three times fast. Number nine, Crime Syndicate. As much as I love the Crime Syndicate and think that they are an awesome team of villains, they are also pretty dysfunctional, which is why they are ranked so low on our list. However, despite the fact that they are often depicted as being at one another's throats and sneaking behind one another's backs in order to basically make sure that they themselves come out on top with the most power, they still manage to have an impressive amount of horrendous achievements, or almost achievements at least. The Crime Syndicate is still a supervillain team that proves to be extremely dangerous whenever our heroes come up against them. Though they would probably be more frightening to face if they could do a little bit better at actually working together like a team instead of constantly double crossing one another. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, be sure to give this video a thumbs up and comment below if you want to help us out here at the channel. I promise you it does really help and we appreciate all your likes and comments. Thank you. Number eight. Daredevil Revenge Squad. Not the official name for this team, I don't think. This team was Typhoid Mary's group of villains. She recruited them to help her get revenge on Daredevil, and they all also had their own motives for doing him harm. All villains who had basically been slighted by the Red Devil themselves in the past. What's more,
more, although this team up only lasted a few issues, it was actually brutally successful, with Typhoid Mary even using her Mary persona at the end of Daredevil issue 259 to kind of ensnare Matt Murdock into like letting his guard down around her. Typhoid Mary recruited the Wild Boys, Ammo, Bullet, and Bushwhacker to help her get the deed done, but insisted on taking the final moment of defeat for herself. Also, is it just me or does Typhoid Mary look huge in this issue? She looks like so tall. I'm just like, wow, what's happening? I don't hate it. Number seven, Gotham City Sirens. Definitely one of the hottest supervillain team-ups out there, in my opinion. Gotham City Sirens isn't just awesome because it's a team of powerful villains, but because it also cemented a fantastic friendship between the three main team members that we can always go back to, and I kinda love that. The Gotham City Sirens are Catwoman, Poison Ivy, and Harley Quinn, who sometimes also have other allies who join them in their villainous adventures. And also, let's be honest, heroic adventures, such as the Carpenter, Jenna Duffy, formerly part of the Wonderland gang. While this team up is one made up of criminals, the team of powerhouses also brought a lot of good out in each other and ended up actually performing a lot of heroic missions together despite their villainous pasts. So this might be a team up of villains, but it's also kind of a hero team in a weird way. Kind of like doing a little bit of both, which I love. Number six, Sinister Six. I didn't realize that I made the Sinister Six number six. I just did that. That was not intentional. I'll take it, like I'll take it, but it was not intentional, just so y'all know. Well, the Sinister Six definitely have their setbacks as a team. There is a reason why they are one of the favorites favorites when it comes to supervillain groups and team-ups. I'm still waiting for them in the MCU. Please, please Marvel, give them to me. With the combined strength and skills of these villains, it seems that no scheme is outside of their reach. In reality though, <laughs> they usually end up in a competition to prove who is the better, which ends with them betraying one another usually, costing them their victories. But this team has still come close to defeating Spider-Man on multiple occasions, and despite their setbacks, they are a team that you can always rely on to find their way back to one another, even if it means uh, sometimes recruiting some new members to their ranks in the process. Also, I'm all for new members being included to the ranks. There's so many good Spider-Man villains. Why limit ourselves? Give me the Sinister 60. Number five, Doctor Doom. I know, right? How could Spidey possibly end up on the same side as the nefarious Victor Von Doom? We actually also see Vision and Scarlet Witch in this crazy crossover. A mystical being called the Dark Rider is attempting to steal Doctor Doom's magical energies, but Spider-Man and Vision attack him together. He uses his powers to make a cat grow to a humongous size and the heroes are kept busy battling it until Scarlet Witch hits it with a hex bolt, returning the cat to its normal size. Unfortunately, all this magic usage only strengthens the Dark Rider's power, and as Spider-Man and Vision watch on, Scarlet Witch realizes they'll have to help Doctor Doom in order to stop their common foe. They have an epic showdown, and Scarlet Witch stuns the Rider, but then he breaks free and incapacitates Doom and the Witch, leaving none to stand in his way. In the next issue, Marvel Team Up number 44, there's a stunning conclusion where Moondragon also joins the party is a whole crazy host of heroes. These team ups are a lot of fun, and they were also a great marketing tool for Marvel back in the day. Number four, Howard the Duck. A lot of these entries are from the Marvel team up series, but this next one is actually from 1996 during the Clone Saga event when Marvel had a run of Spider-Man team ups. In this comic, we're actually treated to two fantastic team ups, the first being Spider-Man and Gambit, but it's actually Spider-Man alongside Howard the Duck that I found really strange. This story crosses over with a Savage Dragon Destroyer Duck story that was in publication by Image Comics at the time. Peter Parker can hardly believe it when he overhears some bystanders say a recent robbery was committed by two men dressed as turtles in space suits. But it's really happening in this crazy crossover that incorporates the world of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Funny enough, there is actually still debate surrounding whether or not the version of Howard the Duck from this comic is canon, with some people arguing that this version of Howard is a clone and actually exists separately from the Image Comics universe. Man, it's clone saga, am I right? Number three, not ready for primetime players. In this absolutely unexpected team up, 
Peter and Mary Jane happened to somehow have tickets to Saturday Night Live. A mysterious, powerful ring was given to a member of the cast, and the Silver Samurai has come to infiltrate the show and try to steal the ring back. We get to see John Belushi, Dan Aykroyd, and even Lorne Michaels as things unfold backstage in the dressing rooms, and Stan Lee is the host of SNL Tonight performing the opening monologue. Sounds like an episode of SNL I would actually want to watch. After a ton of wacky antics and drama, the samurai obtains his ring and disappears back to his own time, presumably. Luckily, the audience has no idea and thinks it was all part of the show. It turns out in the end that the ring was mailed to Belushi by mistake. It's honestly just one trope piled on top of another with a whole bunch of guest stars. So while it's not the most compelling story, it certainly makes for a very memorable comic book moment. Number two, Aunt May and Franklin Richards. This crazy issue sees Spidey totally take the back seat while we go on a crazy escapade with Aunt May, the new Herald of Galactus. This issue opens with the death of Nova and we see Galactus mourn the loss and contemplate what to do. He heads to Earth, hoping to ask Reed Richards for some help but instead finds Franklin Richards at the circus with Peter and his Aunt May. He decides he's going to take Franklin to be his new herald, but Franklin uses his power to transfer the transformation energy from Galactus over to May Parker, transforming her into Golden Oldie, the Herald of Galactus. She's practically a sentient Twinkie in this paper-thin advertisement, but it still has a lot of heart. She collects all of the Twinkies on Earth, to satiate Galactus, but it simply isn't enough, and eventually she finds an entire Twinkie planet, which Galactus promptly devours. Then May comes on back to Earth, and Pete wakes up at the end discovering it was all a dream. Then another person wakes up, seeing that that was just a dream, and there's a few panels of that. It's, it's a pretty funny ending to the whole comic. Number one, Spider-Man and Ren and Stimpy. No doubt one of the weirdest crossovers I've seen, but it was still a fun one. It's Ren and Stimpy number six, where Spider-Man shows up. He definitely gave them a boost because their run went on for 44 issues altogether. If you didn't know, Ren and Stimpy was a popular Nickelodeon show from the 90s that also had a Marvel comic series. Spidey steps in to replace Powdered Toast Man, the beloved mascot of our duo's favorite breakfast cereal. Spidey reveals that he's just stepping in to temporarily fill the job as Toast Man is currently being mind controlled by the evil Doughnut. The whole thing is full to the brim with puns and stuff. Toast man hurling razor sharp bread like batarangs and being called a serial offender. Donut even has to boost his testosterone at one point to help take on Spider-Man. The whole thing is weird, it's wacky, and it's definitely worth checking out. At number 10 we have Batman and Sherlock Holmes. This is the one that probably makes the most sense on this list, believe it or not, because the original Batman has always been a detective above everything, with his original comics actually being called Detective Comics. This adventure is actually number 572 of that comic series and the pairing somehow just seems weirdly right. The only thing is that the Sherlock Holmes stories typically take place in the 1800s, well before Batman's time. So the way they make this work is by just simply having Sherlock be super duper old. Over 100 years old, actually. It works well enough, I guess. The plot is basically that Batman is facing a challenge trying to take down Moriarty and takes Sherlock's help to solve the issue. This is back in the day when Batman was still pretty peppy and fun, bringing Robin along for the ride and everything, so the pair up kind of works in tone as well. It's a fun little moment in time that brings one of the most influential detectives of one era and pairs him up with one of the most influential detectives of this era. All this considered though, it's still weird and I needed to put it on the list. At number nine, we have X-Men versus Star Trek. This is a very weird pairing because Marvel could have easily paired up Star Trek with another team that's more synonymous with space travel, like, you know, the Guardians of the Galaxy. But on the other hand, the X-Men do always show an interest in teaming up with and supporting humans, and they sometimes do go into space. So it sort of works, relatively speaking, that is, in comparison to what else you'll see on this list later. But all in all, this team up is pretty fun, showing off some fun traits of both teams, like, Spock using the Vulcan pinch on Wolverine before they become friendly with one another. But the fun and games subside when the teams are tasked with taking on the threat of the mutant Proteus. This team up actually worked well enough when it was released that they even got a few sequels, so there's that. 
At number eight, we have Batman and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yes, this team up actually happened. When Shredder comes to Gotham and teams up with Ras Al Ghul and they try and, you know, take over the world together, Batman naturally enters the picture. But so do the four Ninja Turtles. The contrast between this darker, more modern Batman and the very fun but very annoying Ninja Turtles makes for a funny combination that is known to actually be pretty good, all things considered. And something about this team up actually does feel right for some reason. Maybe it's the setting of Gotham seeming like it fits for the turtles and maybe also something about the dynamic of these characters. Batman does seem like the perfect straight man to the silliness of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Regardless, it is weird, but fun, but weird, but fun and needed a spot on the list. At number seven is Superman and the Nesquik Bunny. Ah, uh, so as we go deeper into the list, things are getting a little weirder, yes. This one strikes me as bizarre for sure, but also somewhat fitting considering serial companies love to pair characters from pop culture with their brand. But still, that's the only slack I'm gonna cut it. It's it's sort of weird that there is an actual comic book about it because it sort of messes with the canon of Superman. But alas, it happened and it was bananas. Basically just a really long ad for cereal and a pretty weak plot. The villain in this one is Weather Wizard and somehow Superman has genuine trouble taking him down. So who does he call? A group of young children and a rabbit. And even after their victory, there's a chocolate milk chugging challenge that Superman somehow even loses to the bunny. It's just a bizarre journey of sellouts and awkward writing, but I live for things like this that shouldn't exist but do. It just makes things more fun. At number six, there's Batman and Scooby-Doo. Another strangely fitting pairing, this comic made me realize just how many detective characters there actually are out there, and why they keep insisting on teaming up with one another. In this team up, the villain is Man-Bat, which is actually a great choice because he's one of the few Batman villains that's actually a monster, which fits with the Scooby-Doo brand. But this weird match actually isn't the last time people see the Scooby-Doo franchise work its way into the comic book world. Later on, Scooby-Doo will eventually become a sidekick to ace the Bat Hound and continue to solve crimes alongside him. Although I'll be honest, I haven't checked out how those issues looked. Couldn't imagine them being able to fit in anything too dark with Scooby-Doo around, you know? They should never have to know the violence that takes place on the streets of Gotham. In at number five, Hank Pym and Ultron. Standing as one of the definitely more unique hero villain team ups, Hank Pym viewed his creation of Ultron as one of his greatest regrets. And after the events of Rage of Ultron, both Hank and Ultron had merged with one another. There's actually still a belief that traces of Hank can still be found within Ultron, even though he denied this when confronted by Adam Warlock in Infinity Countdown. This isn't necessarily a team up for the sake of fighting off a greater force, but rather an attempt by Hank Pym to stop Ultron. Nonetheless, even forced together, the two had to still work with each other from time to time. In at number 4, Deathlock and Uncanny X-Force. With the Marvel Universe having so many alternate timelines and possible futures, the one that saw the rise of Deathlocks was perhaps the most grim. Many of the Marvel heroes were converted into Deathlocks, which became a mandate just like the Superhuman Registration Act. Cut to present day, the Deathlocks arrived attempting to steal Phantom X's artificial portable biome, which was called the World. Deathlock Prime was able to overpower these new violent tendencies with logic and reasoning. With his newfound hope, he sought to help Phantom X against his former team. He actually succeeds in protecting the world, and as a result of his good deed, he teams up with the X-Force. Over time, Deathlock established himself as a friend of the X-Men, and even began to lecture at Logan's Jean Grey school. In at number three, Super Scroll and Nova. This is a true tale of how just one team up could alter a character's whole reality. See, Super Scroll had been on the receiving end of mockery by his people for a long time after failing to take down the Fantastic Four. However, during the events of Annihilation, he put this behind him in order to protect his people not just from the Annihilation Wave, but soon Ultron as well. Super Scroll could not have done this alone though. Teaming up with Nova and his team of cosmic heroes, Super Scroll was finally able to redeem himself. With the help of Nova, he was able to return to his home, but this time he was praised for his efforts. They even made him a representative for intergalactic affairs. In at number two, Doctor Doom and Doctor Strange. Sounds like a reality show. Right before Secret Wars, the majority of the Marvel multiverse was just beginning to collapse. Each unique world began crashing into one another, leaving almost nothing left. This catastrophic problem would require the universe's greatest minds to set aside their differences and combine their efforts in order to save, well, everything and everyone. The two people we're speaking about is Doctor Strange and Doctor Doom, along with some help by Molecule Man, of course. The Beyonders happened to be the cause of all of these issues, so both men decided the only way was to steal their power. Eventually, they 
succeeded, but this also enacted the new reign of the God Emperor Doom, who put Doctor Strange as kind of his right hand man, making Strange essentially a sheriff that would uphold Doom's new laws. Last but not least in our number one spot, Annihilus and the Avengers. As we reach the end of this list, it's funny to look at how some of these villains go from such evil plots to becoming key players in assisting the superheroes. Annihilus is one of those stories. Once known as the largest threat in the Marvel Universe, he used his cosmic control rod combined with his annihilation wave to leave nothing but total destruction throughout the cosmos. Eventually Nova and his alliance was able to put a stop to this madness, but Annihilus would soon return. However, this time he was in the form of a larvae which would regrow into his previous self. Soon enough, though Annihilus was now part of the intergalactic councils during the events of Infinity. This was the largest council of nations across space and even included the Avengers. At the time the Avengers main focus was attempting to stop the builders from wiping out the universe and as part of his new role Annihilus lended a hand. <laughs> 